Hello, everyone. Good evening, good morning, good day, wherever you are. Uh, welcome. Uh, I'm Wei Ping Wu, and uh, the director of the Master of Science in Urban Planning program at Columbia University. So first, a big welcome. Um, very much wish we could have done this in person, but our students are together in person on campus, the beautiful campus you're seeing a little bit here. And uh, so we are very hopeful um, on our ability to welcome many of you um, next year in person, right? So in the next hour or so, um, you know, I will also have a panel of students join me to answer some of your questions. Um, some of you have um, sent it in ahead of time, as well as some questions that are generally on the minds of prospective students. But before we do that, uh, let me introduce our program in probably 30 minutes. And uh, I would encourage you to put down questions in the chat box. And also after my presentation, I will all um, open up the floor for Q&A as well. So bear with me first, uh, let me uh, introduce um, the program so that many of the questions actually get to be answered through that. So welcome again to Urban Planning Program at Columbia University. This is a very special time in a sense, uh, lots is at stake for you know, our cities, our communities and people who live in there. And certainly for the field of planning, lots are at stake. And so I very much applaud you for having thought about uh, coming to study planning and coming to study at Columbia. And those issues that are really critical at this time of crisis, there are many, but I say there are at least two that are most critical and those really are at the center of our curriculum. And the first is really inequality. And so you're coming to New York City, it's a great and uh, dynamic global city, but it is also one of the most unequal cities in the world. And so this shows you how some neighborhoods are much better off economically than others, right? Um, and then on top of that, let's look at COVID. Uh, this is New York City data on COVID um, percentage of residents uh, infected with COVID, right? And these data, of course, evolve uh, as we move through COVID and really embrace a type of situation where we live with COVID. And so you can see, just look at Manhattan, and those are bluer, right? On the one map, are much lighter on the other, which means they have much less COVID. So inequality. Climate crisis is another key issue at the heart of uh, the crisis we're facing today and how planning can be part of the solution. And New York City, of course, has considered many ways and increasingly more urgent ways to address uh, climate crisis. And that you can see this is one of the examples of what we call rebuild by design. There are many other ways that being considered and implemented, sometimes more on a piecemeal basis. So social, racial, and climate justice really is at the center of our curriculum, not only in the planning program, but more importantly, at GSAP uh, across the school. So uh, we are doing a um, number of systematic efforts to reimagine curriculum and programming. We have a task force of faculty to address that. I uh, happen to be on that task force and really rethinking many other issues related to the built environment professions uh, that we need to confront in terms of racism and racist practices. In urban planning, that's also very much the case. In fact, I would say the planning profession 
has confronted these issues perhaps um, uh, for a while now, and even considering the history of planning in the making of some state violence, particularly through regulations. And so you can see we've been asking students to read about these more intensively, and we've been trying to innovate our curriculum to address these issues. So just to give you a quick sense, in the last two to three years, we've actually created a number of new courses or reimagined some um, existing courses. And you can see the focus on climate crisis, climate adaptation, reimagining the planning framework uh, at local and higher scales to really work um, with neighborhoods, communities, cities, and higher level stakeholders to address climate crisis. And we also are confronting the opportunities and challenges brought by technology, big data, and urban science for the profession. And then we are looking at how we can do more, not only recognizing uh, racism, and inequality, but also to help our students learn to have really skills and some solutions, or at least ways to look for solutions to begin address these um, critical challenges of our time. So these are, are in our curriculum, but you can also see, I don't know if you can see it well, I hope you can, that extra curriculum we have a lecture series that really um, invite many scholars, practitioners to uh, discuss and converse with students and faculty. And this is just for this fall. And every semester, every Tuesday, we have these um, lecture series. So that's, that's really something that uh, brought by the crisis and COVID all of which that we are very keen to be to uh, bring into our curriculum. That said, our program also has a very long history and that history is rich, contextual, as well as um, informative. So as you can see, um, we started uh, basically um, issuing degrees around 1935, um, although before that it was less of a degree, more of a specialization. And then we also had the PhD program and the urban planning program at Columbia has evolved over time and it has taken on a number of very critical and prominent uh, areas of focus. And I will um, speak about them in just a little bit. And on this chart, you can actually see a little bit, right? The issues of justice and global outlook uh, really come up uh, quite uh, frequently. So these are some uh, research and publications by our current and or immediately uh, past, immediate past faculty. And you can see the kind of um, research and scholarship we generate from the full-time faculty. We have a relatively moderate size of full-time faculty, right? Any uh, about a handful, six, and uh, we were looking forward to have all six of them. Uh, next fall, in, in fact, might be even more. Uh, to complement that uh, team of dedicated full-time faculty, we have a, oops, uh, really, I'm very proud of a group of dedicated and seasoned practitioners who have had experiences in the public sector, private sector, nonprofit, and international organizations who then come and teach sometimes one, sometimes two courses, and who have been with us for a number of years, some newer than others, but very much connected. So, our curriculum is very much connected and anchored in practices through connections that these um, pr practitioners bring to the classroom, but also to professional development of our students and career opportunities at their workplace. So I am just actually giving you 
an example, you know, about a dozen or so of our adjunct faculty. And I would encourage you to check out our program booklet. And so uh, Emily Yunker, our program manager, is going to drop a uh, link in the chat box for you on the program uh, booklet. It is also on the open house page for our program as well as the program landing page. In there, you will have a fuller list of all of the adjunct faculty as well as the full-time faculty, what they do and what they study, what they work on and how you can connect your interest with theirs. So very quickly, that booklet also specifies the kind of curriculum we have for the master's degree program, right? So we are PAB accredited, we're two year program requiring at least 60 points. It's basically four semesters of full-time study. We require 27 points, not courses, right? I'm, I apologize, should be uh, points, core requirements, 27 points. And that includes courses, studio in the second semester of first year, and then either a thesis or capstone in the second year. And then, so it's a quite a flexible curriculum, which means you spend a lot more time actually on electives. So 33 points are elective, and at least 12 points should be in the concentration, which, you know, we have four concentrations. They are really the strength of our program. I will explain in just a little bit. And then basically 33 minus 12, you have another 21 credits or points, which are all, but these two terms are very, very similar that you can take across CSAP or Columbia. And so our four concentrations are built environment, community and economic development, international planning and development, and last but not least, urban analytics. And we do not try to be a planning program that covers everything. So if you have any questions about areas, whether we cover it or not, please uh, you know, jot down or ask us later. We really try to focus on uh, our critical strength as well as um, the uh, prominent challenges of the day. And we also have a part-time uh, option. Uh, those are really open only to people who have already had eight, I'm sorry, two year full time or four year part time experience prior to application. So that's important. Uh, the details are on, are on our website. So check them out. And essentially you take twice as long as um, the full time option. So if you have any questions also let us know. So as you can see, the first year, you are very much engaged in required curriculum. And almost all of the required courses are taught by our full-time faculty, which really anchor our program's um, curriculum core values, knowledge, and skills. And so that will be history and theory of planning, GIS planning methods, right? And then the second semester, you will take economics for planning, for planners, uh, planning law and planning studio. Studio is actually an excellent um, learning method and mechanism, somewhat different uh, from your typical courses and somewhat similar to um, architecture studios. The key difference is our studios are always collaborative and teamwork and we'll have a real client and a real project and engagement with stakeholders. So in a way it's some programs may call it field projects, all right? And uh, some programs may call it um, client projects. Um, so kind of similar, but ours is very much team-based. And so in, your, in the second year, students have a lot of room to take electives, pursue their concentration and other interests. And thesis and capstone, so you take either thesis or capstone, it's two semester sequence. So uh, you get to work on something in depth on your own individually to either prepare for your professional career or to prepare to become you know, a doctoral student down the road, a researcher, or to learn a new skill or to work directly with a client. 
And then with that in mind, we also have a lot of cross-disciplinary connections, both within GSAP. You can see we have dual degrees with MARC, Master of Architecture, Historic Preservation and Real Estate Development, as well as across Columbia. You can certainly, we, ha we are having more and more students who want to uh, cross train. So they are involved in dual degree programs, but you don't have to, you can take courses. In fact, at GSAP, all of the electives in all of the programs are open to all students in GSAP. Uh, with the other schools, you just need to be more strategic. We uh, provide a list of relevant courses to all our students uh, for outside of GSAP. So, any questions about that, feel free uh, to jot down or ask later. So you can see biz school, law school, social work, um, public health uh, and uh, international affairs. Uh, we all have dual degrees. And so for the four concentrations, and uh, we generally organize our courses along those lines. And then you can see we have built an environment is probably uh, the most um, heavily subscribed concentration, um, um, more students, as well as because we're in a design school. And so we are connected with architecture and other designers. And so you have interaction with other students as well. And you can see here any courses that have a star next to it count for um, two concentrations. So that's the strategic way that you will want to plan your study program uh, for the two years or four semesters you are here. And uh, you probably can see some of the courses on my early slide are new and others are more um, core and uh, um, been around for a little bit. And then so the kind of work that students do in studio related to built environment, this is um, Long Island City Waterfront Studio spring of 2020. In fact, um, there's been a lot of featuring of Long Island City now becoming regenerated or revitalized, particularly through uh, immigrants as well as um, you know, uh, second generation immigrants, uh, Asian Americans. It's very interesting, formerly industrial area that's now uh, undergoing in a sense what we call um, revitalization. Community and economic development are, um, is our second concentration. And um, in there, we particularly emphasize the issue of social justice and racial justice and how that manifests in the built environment, in the planning process and in community development. So we, um, for instance, we have, I'm really quite proud of a new course we have this semester called a community development finance practicum really get students to work with uh, community organizations to try to um, develop strategies and, uh, and sources of finance for community development projects. And this example also has been ongoing for two years now, um, particularly in this virtual um, environment last year to work with the school in Washington Heights, just, uh, you know, uh, north and uh, around Harlem to really look at how environmental justice issues as reflected in street network and infrastructure can be addressed by residents users around um, uh, the area. So you can see um, how students work with high school students to uh, uh, envision for the neighborhood and for the thorough fair that runs through the neighborhood. International planning and development, you know, in a sense, it's a little bit um, paradoxical, we even have a separate uh, concentration, really, it's more to organize courses, really, you know, if you look at built environment courses, some already have international contents, economic development courses, we should too. But in our international planning and development concentration, we also address issues that are not necessarily in the other concentrations. For instance, we look at you know, a climate change at a global scale. We also look at the crossing overs of people through migration, the crossing overs of capital through investment, 
and how um, these global flows affect um, climate practices. And not only in you know, cities like New York or London that are very global, but also more importantly, actually, in cities in the global south and how the imbalance of power and connections affect different places in different ways. And that's one theme in the international planning and development concentration. The other is really about, so we know many planning practices in the past have sort of generated or originated from the global north, right? So think about zoning, uh, think about uh, transit-oriented development, right? And then, you know, we, in the planning, there was this perception that the global south could really learn from these experiences. But we know, especially during COVID, but even before that, that the global south has really, you know, countries and cities in those regions really have been very innovative in terms of using limited resources and using different kinds of planning processes to create solutions or um, you know, resolutions to confront uh, similar kinds of urban challenges. So think about participatory budgeting, right? That uh, originated from Brazil. And uh, you know, think about bus rapid transit, okay? Also, you know, a different city in Brazil, um, in Curitiba, and then Bogotá, and now more and more in other uh, cities in the global south. Because building subways simply is too expensive and technologically very demanding. And for many cities in the global south, uh, that is not uh, a good solution. So we now see that global north cities are more and more looking to the global south for these kinds of um, important and pragmatic solutions. And so this kind of what we call international planning is really not to say we're going to transfer or just carry certain practices in different places, to another set of places, but to really try to understand what has made participatory budgeting or bus rapid transit worked in their originating places and how they may or may not work well uh, in another uh, place given the different and unique political and social economic context of that second set of places. So we really try to uh, help our students understand that um, there aren't oftentimes ready-made solutions that are portable to understand the nature of the solution and the nature of the problem and the nature of you know, some of these transfer of planning practices uh, is really more important than just knowing about these practices. So you can see um, the kind of courses we offer here. When, when we were able to travel, we every year we had a couple of travel studios and we are very hopeful by next spring, this may resume. Um, before pandemic, we're able, we were able to travel to international locations. Uh, we are hoping at least in the spring, we might be able to do domestic travel and maybe even um, international, but you all know challenges abound. And the, um, so we have to be uh, agile and much like our curriculum is agile, um, our decisions have to be so as well. And so urban analytics is our newest concentration and it's really been growing. And I, I am very excited and very proud of our growth in the last few years. And yes, the number of courses is still smaller than the other concentrations. But as you can see, we have courses that deal with the fundamentals, that deal with machine learning, a little bit more advanced uh, data analytics, and then that deal with um, using digital platforms for prototyping, uh, planning products, meaning sort of 
uh, small scale solutions that can help either with planning process or planning decision making. And then uh, last but not least, we have a new course this semester called Urban Analytics, Analytics and Human Centered Decision Making, also working with clients, one in Brazil, one uh, in Harlem, of course, virtually with Brazil to really use data analytic, analytics to inform decision making. So there are also courses at GSA uh, offered by the visual studies program that also count for some uh, urban analy for analytics concentration. So all of the courses you've just seen are just urban planning courses. There are other courses in the school I have not included, but we will share with students once um, they uh, matriculate, right? So we also have a couple of skill-based courses that are really important and, uh, and very popular among students. One on professional skills and communication, and one on project uh, management. So we do want to, so generally I would tell students, we try to prepare students to become generalists. That is know many subjects in planning and with some deep understanding of either one or two directions, right? So you can see that kind of work that students have done with uh, analytics uh, in the context of climate change uh, and the kind of um, presentation and visualization skills our students have it's, are really quite impressive. And this is more spatial analysis in GIS. So curriculum is not the only um, asset we have. Uh, really important is we want to help students get ready to be emerging professionals, not only in jobs that are typical of urban planning graduates, but also in emerging types of jobs that should uh, really benefit, that could really benefit from planning skills and values. And I will show you a little bit of what they are in, in just a minute, uh, minute or so. So we do that through um, a set of efforts to help our students. So advising and mentoring. So Emily Yunker, uh, many of you probably have been in touch with her. And so I would encourage you to reach out if you have really uh, deep questions after you have reviewed the program booklet and um, you still want to know more or you want to potentially talk to a professor. Unfortunately, we cannot invite you to be on campus and sit in the class this semester. Um, so we'll need to find other ways to connect you. So we will, uh, once students are admitted, we will connect admitted students with current students one-on-one -on -one as well. So you can see here, uh, Emily and I provide a lot of advising to students, both in groups as well, in, as, well as in person individually. Then we have our full-time faculty, each uh, helps a group of students as a faculty advisor. Of course, they meet usually individually. And then in the second year, each student will have a thesis or capstone advisor. We also have student mentors with uh, extracurriculum uh, help uh, that include workshops, office hours, and um, help with student work. And so this semester we have two student mentors, one in more um, presentation and writing skills, the other more dig uh, data and coding skills. Um, Last but not least, uh, we have a mentorship program connecting current student with alumni one-on-one, -on -one, uh, uh, usually in the second year, but some first year students like to do that. And so that has been quite successful. We have been doing that for the last few years already. So as we help our students getting ready for um, careers that they want after graduation, uh, we have identified a number of career paths for our students, as you can see from this um, uh, slide. And you know, this this session is being recorded, and we will put the recording on our website so you can see this a little more careful, you know, in detail when you have time. And so you can see this is just uh, the first uh, six of the about twelve a dozen or so career paths that we have identified based on survey of our 
recent alums, so basically in the last five years, right? So you can see they not only work in traditional planning kinds of uh, positions, but also in emerging kinds of positions, especially as we go to the second page, right? So, um, you know, consulting firms, real estate firms, urban tech firms, or even just tech firm, right? Uh, and certainly doctoral studies. Every year we have one, one or few students up, go uh, apply and uh, some are success, successful, but not all are successful. So if you have any questions about that, I'm happy to answer as well. And so we, this again, of course, was prior to pandemic. Uh, we are uh, using different ways um, to host career fairs. Uh, to engage students with uh, prospective employers. Um, these career fairs are usually held uh, in a form of what we call informational interviews. And so they are not the same as let's say this school, sometimes law school where um, people actually hire students right off the bat, but it's really more about understanding these organizations and really uh, setting up content, right? And this is our lovely, uh, planning lounge. Uh, I'm very happy that it has returned to its original form, which is this. Uh, during pandemic, it was really used just as computer lab. And so we have uh, about thir uh, 35 computers in the lounge, which you don't see because this is an area where um, people actually lounge around. So we have two other rooms in the suite. Uh, one is computer lab and one is the classroom. So students really hang out there a lot. This is sort of their community. And this is the kind of work our students are able to create in at data analytics and GIS, uh, advanced GIS, or what we call advanced spatial analysis. And, um, and our students also have uh, quite a bit um, extra extra curriculum, I guess you will call it activities. So this is an urban magazine that students produce once every semester they produce an issue and it's been ongoing for decades now. So it's uh, really an excellent way of honing your skills and uh, engage in uh, conversations or debates uh, with your colleagues and even sometimes faculty and sometimes colleagues from other schools. So I know you all are interested. And so I have to say a few words about the application and admission process. So we're towards the end of my presentation. So uh, we really give a very comprehensive type of review to each application. So this year, of course, GRE is not required. I had a question from someone who said, oh, what is your average GPA um, for admitted students? We actually, that's just one indicator. We do not uh, really um, get fixated on that. If so, we actually don't calculate uh, average GPA for admitted students. Uh, but I general, generally, I think you know, above three uh, is probably uh, quite strong. And so, our students also come from a variety of backgrounds, some directly out of school. So I have another question of uh, asking whether I could, you know, a student could go on to graduate school directly from after graduating college. Uh, the answer is a qualified yes. Uh, yes, we definitely have students who are just out of um, college. Uh, but generally during college, they have had some relevant experience through internship. Uh, uh, when I say relevant, I don't mean it necessarily needs to be in planning, but it could be in engineering. It could be in uh, biology or environmental studies and going on field work, but something related to how the real world you know, works, right? Something that gets you to think about what you might be interested in in studying once you come here. So we really would like you um, to kind of um, show us some experience relevant to a planning field and now we will value that. We also very much value recommendation letters from uh, your professors or former professors on your academic preparation. Some of you may have worked 
in our, uh, the world for a while, in the real world for a while, and that we very much value. And so if you have recommendation letters from your supervisors or colleagues, that's very good. But at least, please, one out of three letters, at least one letter should be about your academic preparation. And so that's important. So we looked at all of these. And so let me just say a few words about the personal statement. And that is really, really important. Now that you know we don't uh, ask for GRE, we certainly will look at your transcript, look at your, uh, if you have a sample of writing or uh, the kind of courses you've taken uh, before coming to graduate school. But we really want to learn from your personal statement and your understanding of the planning field. So why do you want to come to planning, right? What do you want to do after you get a graduate degree in planning? So what kinds of planning issues are at the center of your interest? You know, you might have primary interests, you might have secondary interests. Tell us all. Actually, we don't mind if it's a little bit longer than 800, 800 words, uh, but it should definitely not be just 300 words, right? I mean, that, 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 you're not gonna be able to tell us much in that. We also would like you, we on our app, uh, admission website, this one is specified. We would like you to tell us about your experience with analytical reasoning. They can include, but not limited to statistics, or even econometrics, GIS, data analysis or analytics, big data, or qualitative methods. As I mentioned, our students come from all over, um, you know, the various different academic fields, right? All the way from arts, photography. Emily started studied photography. <laughs> she can tell you an undergrad and uh, anthropology, sociology, political science, geography, urban studies, environmental studies, cultural studies, communication. So that's all a little bit more social science and humanities side. We also have students come from business, um, from economics, uh, then the even more towards engineering, uh, civil engineering, very common. Civil engineering actually is quite common. And then sciences, right, biology, uh, uh, some even physics, math, all possible. We have students really from all over the map. And so we want to know uh, how you think your experience is relevant. And then so uh, last but not least, uh, we have been increasing financial aid to students. Certainly, you know, federal financial aid in, term, in the form of loans and work studies. This, of course, are confined to U.S. students, but our scholarships are available to both U.S. and international students. These fellowships, or what we call scholarships, are based on both needs and merit. So we uh, really want to help talented students who are um, challenge in terms of uh, uh, financial resources to be able to pursue the education they want to. Columbia is expensive. I very much recognize that. And, um, and we know that we have to do better in terms of making more scholarships available. So another form of financial assistance is through a research assistant or teaching assistance. Um, assistance, and um, these are usually more available to second year students because they have already taken those courses and we know them better, but occasionally a few first year students also uh, can get these and these are competitive uh, and uh, these also allow you to apply for assistantship uh, maybe not even in planning program, like Bill Center at GSAP basically um, recruits uh, RAs from across the school. Okay, so that's the uh, financial aid part. So last but not least, 
I would love for you to really read uh, these two web pages uh, carefully, thoroughly before you reach out with questions by email. Lots and lots of questions would have been answered by those two pages, the first two pages, right? The first page uh, that I show here is the landing page of our program. The second page is um, a, a sort of a set of information that is specifically targeted at you, uh, our prospective students. And actually I find that page to be quite a bit more useful, right? And the booklet is there, student work examples are there, recordings of our weekly lecture series is there. The third link is for students who would like to get assistance on your application. We really try uh, to give our current students autonomy on that. So this is a student organized effort. It has nothing to do with the application process or the admission process. So if you do get assistance, that's great, but that doesn't give any advantage or disadvantage in the application process. So if you go to that page, you can fill out a form. Emily doesn't see it. I do not see it. Nobody in the admission office sees it. And so that goes straight to a number of student volunteers through our program council, which is, which is a student organization. So if you have any question, one of their officers will be in the panel in a few minutes where you can ask him. So they do have a first come first serve principle uh, because um, you know, as semester progresses towards the end that they get pretty busy. And so they're gonna try to help as much as they can. And so especially for those of you who lack financial or other resources to put together a strong application. So uh, with that, I think I went a little bit over time, but we still have quite a bit of time, almost close to an hour, at least uh, to answer your questions. So let me stop sharing. And, um, and then I can see your faces and we can um, answer some of your questions. Okay, so it looks like we don't have any questions in the chat box. It's probably easier to put in the chat box. It's a lot harder with more than three screens or actually we have four screens to really try to see your hand. So I see a Rusa and then Isaiah. Okay, great. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, I was just about to type them in the, in the chat. Um, so I was, I was wondering about um, students in the urban planning program that have chosen to do a dual degree. Um, I am a little bit interested in um, doing a dual degree with the program in real estate. And I was wondering mm -hmm. if you guys have any perspective as how, you know, how strenuous or, or taxing is it to do um, a dual degree program or um, is, it, is it pretty doable or just what is your experience with students trying to do that? Yeah, excellent. So what I should do is actually to introduce our panel of students because they might be able to answer your questions better than I do or than Emily does. And sure. so if we could do that and I will just kind of throw some questions. So I know we at least have one student uh, is Yuning here. Yeah, so she does, she has a um, dual degree, not uh, real estate, but public health, but very similar in terms of structure of the dual degree program. But before I ask her to answer your question, let me, let me ask our current students to introduce each of you by yourself. And I think that will just kind of make uh, asking questions a little easier. So um, let me just look at the screen. So I first see, so first, Emily. Emily, you should introduce yourself first. All right, hi everyone. I'm Emily Juncker. I'm the program manager for urban planning. I'm also an alumni of GSAP. I did both the urban planning and the historic preservation program. So I do have experience as a dual degree student at GSAP. Um, 
have gone through the thesis process, the studio, everything. So I can also answer your questions as a, an alumni of the program and also um, from the administrative perspective, um, since I've now been managing the program for over a year. Great, and Derek? Hi everyone, um, I am a second year UP student. Um, my concentrations are in built environment and uh, community and economic development. Um, so I'm interested in housing, uh, housing policy, homelessness issues. Um, I'm also on program council. Um, so I'm uh, actually helping organize that uh, program that Wei Ping mentioned at the end of her presentation to provide support for, uh, uh, for applications. Nope. Um, Great. That's, that's me. Mm -hmm. Kat? Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in tonight. Um, I'm also a second year student in the urban planning program. And my background before coming to Columbia, I was in natural resource conservation and disaster recovery planning. I actually met um, students from doing their studio project in Puerto Rico. And that's how I got into contact with um, Columbia. And that's why I submitted an application. So that also brought me to my concentration, which is international planning and urban analytics. Also, I'm the co-director of Latin GSAP, which I guess the main goal is to bring students together in GSAP, whether you're in planning, architecture, urban design, and real estate development, if you're from Latin American country, or if you're like me, you're American, but you're Latino. So if you have questions about that, let me know. And it's nice to meet you. Yep. Thank you, Kat. Uh, Mauricio? Hi, everyone. My name is Mauricio. Um, I'm a second year urban planning student. My concentration is in urban analytics. Also, I'm from Peru. And uh, well, currently I'm also working uh, as a coding and programming mentor. Um, yeah, thank you. Yep. Sorry. Um, hi everyone. My name is Hori. Um, I'm originally from Seoul, South Korea. Uh, my concentrations are urban analytics and community economic development. Um, I am an international student, so I can answer um, some questions about that. And also I'm doing a capstone for um, graduation. So um, I can also take some questions about that too. Thank you. Great, and uh, Yuning. Hi, I'm Yuning and I'm a second year urban planning student. Uh, so this is my last semester here with the urban planning program. I finished a year uh, in the public health school. Um, so my concentration with, uh, in urban planning program is urban analytics, uh, and my department at Melman is, sorry, Melman is the public school, uh, public health school um, is environmental health science, sciences. So I can ask, ask, I can try to answer questions regarding um, do degree, and uh, I'm also an international student as well. Yeah, great. So. Let me get back to Arusa, your question about uh, dual degree with um, real estate program. Um, so we don't have any student, although you can see all our five students have a variety of interests and you know, kind of coverage, regional origin, national origin. So um, what, that's how we hope we can answer a lot of your questions. And so with, uh, so real estate is a, uh, three semester, essentially one year program, right? Uh, using summer. So for planning students who do a uh, dual degree with the real estate, essentially you would need to start taking classes the first summer, meaning uh, after you finish fall and spring, the first summer, um, you can start, or you can start the second summer, but that's a little bit too late. Usually people start the first summer. And you just need actually one additional semester. So um, you would need two years plus a fall semester. Um, and that's what basically Yuning is doing, right? You're doing just one additional semester. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. And can you tell us also <laughs> so, in the summer? Because that's how our uh, real estate does. Oh, so what did you say, what did you say? The, um, the program over the summer? Did you take courses in oh. public health over the summer? Uh, no, so with public health, it's, uh, only, one, it's only one year, um, but they do require you to do 
a PRETCOM or it depends on your department. So that the, that it just depend on your department. Department For Department of Environmental Health Science, they require PRETCOM and for some other departments, um, I don't know if it, yeah, um, that you can also write in this thesis. Uh, and that's, um, people usually do that over the summer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great, thank you. Um, Emily, I'll let you moderate which question we should, who we should talk to. Sure, let's hear from Isaiah since he had his hand raised. And Great. then I'll go into the um, chat box questions in, in the order they were received. Great, yep, let's do that. Hi, um, I'm sorry, excuse, excuse my background. Um, I just had a quick question about the relationship, <coughs> excuse me, the relationship that Columbia and the, and the urban planning program as a whole has in relationship to the community of Harlem or Upper Manhattan in general. I mean, as like a school urban planning, we all know that Columbia is one of the largest gentrifying forces in that in that area of the city. And so there's a way that the university is contextualizing that even within the program itself. Yes, and that's a really important question. And especially in the last two years I uh, have really generated a lot of rethinking and reckoning. And you're absolutely right. The relationship between the university and the community uh, is a very complex one, oftentimes very contentious and oftentimes quite um, uh, challenging for uh, the community around us. So we in the planning program take um, a very much of uh, starting point as what we call unlearning whiteness. You know, Columbia has been a very white institution for a long time. And that is true also with GSAP. And so in the last couple of years, we really trying to rethink how we should be engaging with uh, Harlem, the community. So we start the university, not the university, actually the university has had a program for a while, but our school just started a new program called the Community Fellows. And in fact, the students will get to meet uh, the two fellows in the next month or so. And so we're trying to really invite the community into our school, of course, at a small scale right now. And then that one course I described as uh, climate justice in our own backyard is really inviting the students in, uh, working together. And then we have a practicum called um, uh, community engagement and, uh, uh, um, and planning uh, in Harlem. And that involves a historian who has worked on um, uh, Harlem history for a long time. And we're gonna re-offer that course in the spring because in, during the pandemic, it was very difficult to go, you know, sort of into the community. So we, uh, really try um, to be more mindful of um, how much you know harm that Colombia has done, and how how important it is to be um, really talking to um, residents there and uh, not have any preconceptions of you know what's best for the community. So this uh, practicum will be led by two practitioners who have done a lot of work in Harlem uh, and, and hope and uh, taking students uh, to meet and connect with um, both community um, board as well as residents, yeah. And so does that answer your question, Isaiah? It does. I was wondering also from a student perspective how that, you know, because we have like a really diverse sort of panel of students here and how they are also embodying that as well and taking through that. Thank you though. Yep, any takers? I mean, I'll go. So uh -huh. I suppose, yes, we have our practicums as well as our student projects. I think that's, a little more academic, but also through the student groups, we do have volunteer opportunities or just forums to have the chance to also connect with Harlem as well. Okay, great. Um, 
Okay, I'm going through, okay. All right, so, difference between okay. capstone and thesis. Oh, sorry, Emily. Yeah, that was the same one I was gonna go to. <laughs> okay, yeah, how do you prepare students for different postgraduate work? Yes, so um, thesis used to be the only option for students and we added the capstone just um, two years ago. So we don't have a lot of capstone, you know, kind of projects to look back on yet, but this year I think there are a number of them. Um, generally thesis is a uh, more research oriented and it's uh, what we call propositional based uh, research process that are you trying to construct uh, an argument and, and then you collect evidence and analyze the evidence or information or data and to support your uh, proposition, right? Capstone is more practice anchored or real world anchored. You know, thesis can be real world anchored, but thesis is not about uh, what we call it a, a crystal ball. It's not about the future. It's more about the past or current. Capstone on the other hand can be about all of them, but oftentimes about the future, right? What do you do? with uh, environmental gentrification, say around the high lines, uh, uh, what kind of uh, strategies that communities along the high lines could up, take up. And it's a little bit similar to a studio, but it's individual based. And so um, that's the main difference. Uh, but Capstone also can be in multiple ways of de final products delivery. It could be an app, it could be, a, model, it could be a client report, it could be a plan. Um, so it's uh, much more uh, diverse in terms of the uh, final delivery. Uh, how do you prepare students for differing postgraduate work? That's a good question. Maybe I should um, leave that to some of the students. What uh, Maybe um, Mauricio, you've done an internship uh, in Washington, D.C., maybe you can help us a little bit with that question. Yeah, so I was, I did, a, sorry for the appearance, and I'm gonna, yeah. Uh, so I did an internship this summer uh, at the World Bank, uh, spe specifically at the branch called International Finance Corporation. It was mostly uh, focused on how we can estimate the uh, impact of green policies and different indicators for global South cities, especially given that there is not much data, for example, uh, the program, uh, most of the courses are, are studying New York, and in New York we have a lot of data. But this is not a case in, in cities like uh, Bangalore, Lima, Buenos Aires. So this project, the World Bank, uh, which focused on uh, gathering the data from global south cities and estimated uh, the green policies impact. And I will say, like for example, the program uh, helped me in in the way that so one of the a greatest thing of the program is that we can craft our, uh, our curriculum so we can choose uh, which electives we think might be most useful for us and for our uh, career. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mauricio. I may be sorry. I think you are in the Community uh, Development Planning Fellowship Program. Maybe you can uh, tell us a little bit about that on how that could prepare you for what you want to do down the road. Um, yeah, sure. Um, so um, currently I am a fellow, um, community planning fellow for the Fund of the City of New York. Um, I am working for Manhattan Community Board 2, and there I am um, in charge of a specific project uh, related to Open Streets program. And um, I have uh, weekly meetings with uh, people at the community board, which is really great because you get to meet um, um, people who used to be in the field and you get a lot of advices and feedbacks about your projects. So I think um, it really helps me to um, figure out what I want to do um, after graduation and um, also um, think about um, all the planning issues in a more like community based um, in, a, in a community based pers perspective. Um, so yeah, yeah. <laughs> and Eric, you are in the program too, right? Um. Um, yeah, I am. Uh, Yuning is as, as well. You happen to get oh, all yes. three of okay. us in here at the same time. Good. Uh -huh. um, but yeah, I'm in the same fellowship. Uh, so I'm working with Community Board 4 in Manhattan. 
Um, and we are working on a really interesting project where we are looking at commercial vacancies in the district and uh, basically putting together a proposal for a city program to convert those commercial vacancies into supportive housing, affordable housing, and homeless shelters, um, as well as turning retail space into um, you know, health services and, and community amenities like that. Well, it sounds um, like almost like the continuation of your studio project. Yeah, exactly. It really like fell into place really well. Um, but yeah, I love it for a lot of the same reasons Sori mentioned. Um, it's a fantastic like networking opportunity. You know, I'm meeting a lot of people who work in the field and, you know, just people who do like interesting stuff that I never knew about, you know, okay. so it's very hands-on. Great. Yep. So let's move on to the next question. Is it possible to do a dual degree in urban design and planning? No, it's not possible because the urban design program is what we call a post-professional degree, which means you have to have a design uh, undergrad or actually civil engineering as long as it's professional degree, five years, you can get into urban design. So that's pretty difficult to ask urban planning students to do. So for instance, we don't require a professional degree for our applicants, right? So because of that, then uh, it's not possible to do a dual degree with urban design. But we do have a course, a uh, very good course called Urban Design for Planners. And then our, in our studio, um, we at least have, uh, have at least one or maybe two studio projects that are very much design oriented. Um, and then we run extracurriculum workshops on some of the basic design software and you know like sketchup uh, autocad and so on okay what do students typically do in the summer between their first and second year so maybe i can ask you Ning, uh, you already heard about mauritius summer internship maybe cat whoever wants to chime in what do you do in the summer yeah um the the first summer I was during COVID, uh, I had an internship with a, um, I don't know if people heard of CFAD, it's like a lead uh, building rating company. Uh, that was very difficult and was fully remote um, and opportunities at the time was very limited. So I just had to take it. But the past sum the summer, this summer, I had a really interesting internship with the uh, Department of City Planning at their capital uh, planning division. And uh, that's like city provides a lot of internship opportunities, whether it's like during school year or summer um, and they're, they're constrained, like they're usually six months. So it's, um, um, and, and they have like um, career developments and a lot of um, networking opportunities because they, um, they are, those opportunities are geared towards students who, um, who wanted to, um, serve the city in the future so uh, those are great opportunities and um, yeah uh, th I, th I think that's one thing like great with the New York City there's just so many things that you can you can do uh, whether it's like city related or community boards um, it's it's um, you just have to look for it and uh, find off um, prof professors um, as the boy already mentioned many of them are pr practitioners and um, yeah, they can connect you to many of those resources as well. Um, so yeah, just really quickly. So yeah, just about all of them have done summer internship. I just want to let you know that we do not have summer programming in, in terms of courses. We actually very much encourage our students to pursue internship or to use summer to travel. Uh, we do have summer workshop, which only takes about two weeks so you can still do internship and do summer workshop did any of you do a summer workshop this year um i i was in the workshop with douglas woodward and it uh -huh. was about residual spaces in new york city and it was really um like it was a great experience because we um, spent a year spent a year through zoom and then it was our first um experience to actually meet in person and like do a lot of field work um in new york city we so we like uh went to harlem and also we had a field trip to um a lot of like uh, privately owned public spaces in new york city so and yeah and it was a really good chance to meet other um students in other programs within GSAP, like urban design students and also real estate development students. So 
yeah, I really um, enjoyed the experience. Yeah. yeah. Great. Um, so next question, is there an option to submit a portfolio during the application process? Yes, but truth be told, we don't look at the portfolio quite carefully the same way as if you are applying for the Master of Architecture program or Urban Design program. In planning, portfolio is less critical. If anything, a writing sample would help us more. Uh, really, um, the visual and the visualization skills our students take are way beyond most you know, planning students would have in many other planning programs. Uh, so it's a, definitely a plus, but we don't require every single student to have those kind of visualization skills. Some students choose to focus more on writing, more you know, big you know, data analysis or a more qualitative approach. Um, uh, yes, if you only get in the dual program, dual, if you're applying for dual degrees, you have to get in both degrees, not necessarily at the same time. So many students actually say come into planning and then apply for public health during their first year in planning. Yu Ning, was that the case with you? Yes, but um, yes. And, and, and I think one thing to keep in mind is to take enough credits that first semester. Yeah. And we also have students, I believe we have another student who started at public health first and then applied to get into uh, planning. Yeah. So it could go either way. Uh, but you really do need to apply it the very first year. If you say get into planning and you want to do a duel with a uh, master of architecture, you really should be applying, you know, the first year of, of planning program. Otherwise, it won't be dual degree. It'll be consecutive. Um, okay, at what point during the program do students choose their concentration? So at the initial contact point, quote unquote, is when students choose studios. So all of these students have done studio in the spring, but in uh, last November and December, when we presented, uh, when we pitched the different studio projects, they choose, and then they kind of indicate what concentration or concentrations, because uh, almost 40% or so students choose two concentrations and they intend to pursue. And then we try to match their studio projects with their intended concentration well, and the real final confirmation is uh, basically in another month or two. In December, we will be asking all of these students now, what is your concentration? So we want to make sure they have enough credits by next spring for at least one concentration. Okay. Ah. So do we, do you need to pick a concentration and indicate our interest towards that in our personal statement? Um, yes or no. Uh, I always encourage our students to really explore in their first year, uh, especially first semester, and really kind of see um, what it's all, all of interest to them, what is possible, uh, and students often change. So it really doesn't matter. It's not gonna make or break your application. Okay, are there other uh, student organizations? Yes, so Kat had talked about the Latin GSAP and Derek, do you wanna talk a little bit about Program Council? Sure. Um, yeah, so like I said earlier, I am a member of Program Council. Uh, we are um, kind of like a student government body. Uh, we kind of, we meet every week in public meetings that are open to all students. Um, anyone can come by and kind of like give their feedback about things that are going on in the program uh, or, um, you know, the things that they would like to see happen. Um, we coordinate events, we plan events, and we, um, we, and we throw events. Uh, and we also meet with the faculty um, at their meetings pretty much once a month. And that kind of gives us an opportunity to be a liaison between the student body and the faculty and, um, you know, communicate student needs and uh, things going on with the students then and vice versa. Great. Um, so, yeah, and uh, uh, we also have a Urban China Network, 
um, quite active. They organize conferences, they organize uh, competition last year and uh, oh, last semester, and then they organize career panels specifically uh, catered to students who want to maybe go back to China. So they're also QSAP um, for basically queer students at GSAP. And then there's also black student uh, uh, organization. So uh, I think Emily has dropped a link to the list of all organizations, uh, student organizations at GSAP. Uh, we have about uh, a handful in the planning program and you are welcome to create one, right? So uh, we have had students who create one. So for application fee waiver for international students, it's generally targeted towards students from low resource countries. And you should just go to um, our admissions um, page or Emily, you can drop the email, the general uh, uh, admissions email. That's where you should uh, send a request to. We have not, we don't really have the capacity to uh, make the decision. It's the admissions office at, in the school that makes that decision. Okay, so for the applications, optional but recommended work sample, what may look like a student without a background in planning? Uh, yeah, um, your actually work sample is not required. It's completely optional. And it's totally fine to not have a work sample. We have, in fact, the large percentage of applications uh, do not have a work sample and it is really fine. Um, you want to actually submit all the required materials well and really put some time in, um, in writing that personal statement, get good, uh, what, when I mean good recommendation letters, I don't mean they should be just positive. They should be detailed. They should really speak to your academic preparation. If you really are interested in submit a architecture portfolio, feel free, but I, can't I can tell you it won't break or make your application. Ah, Emily, that is for you. Uh, the overlap, if any, between urban planning and HP dual degree. Sure, so I would encourage anyone who's interested in doing the dual with HP and UP, feel free to send me an email and I can tell you a little bit more about it, but just to keep things short um, and get to some of the other questions today, I'm gonna kind of generalize it to be more about any of the dual degrees within GSAP. So um, the overlap comes a lot in the elective coursework. When you do the dual degree with um, historic preservation and urban planning, um, there's only really one course that like definitively overlaps between two programs and that is the dual studio course. So it's in the fall, there's an urban planning and historic preservation studio, which brings together urban planning students and historic preservation students. Um, but then a lot of your other uh, overlap is gonna come from the elective courses. So when you are enrolled in any program at GSAP, you can take electives across the different courses. Um, so when you are in uh, historic preservation and urban planning, you might be mixing up your urban planning and historic preservation electives to kind of target them um, more specifically to your interests. I think for me personally, I definitely um, took the elective courses that were in preservation that were related more to like preservation policy rather than the materials coursework, um, which usually tends to relate more to architecture, but you know, you can also take architecture history courses. There's a lot of cross-disciplinary courses offered throughout GSAP where we bring together students from all of the programs. So, um, there's a lot of overlap in those ways. Yep. So how are students able to have two concentrations? Sorry, did I hear that you have two concentrations or CAT? Yes, and I believe you addressed it that there are a lot of courses that overlap. For instance, urban analytics and human-centered decision-making, I believe is one of them. And also disaster planning is how I'm able to you just have to be very strategic with how you plan your courses. Right. And or you, you yeah. know, yeah. Or you, because you have a lot of room, right? Right, like, exactly. Like 21 credits of worth of elective. You don't want to go beyond planning. You can just take more electives, right? In planning. So the curriculum is pretty flexible in the sense of um, 
not requiring to take, not requiring our students taking a lot of core courses. And um, yeah. How large is the UP program? So every year we try to construct a class of about 45 to 50 students. Um, sometimes we go overboard, sometimes we go underboard, right? <laughs> so, uh, but so at any given time, we have about 100 to 110 master's students because like, you know, Yuning, uh, she's been with us more than two years because she has to be over at public health for a little bit, but we keep her, you know, we keep in touch with her through all of the, uh, you know, um, email communications. We consider her our students at all time. And so um, that's the general uh, size. Then there are about 20 uh, PhD students uh, who also interact with uh, master students, especially you know, many of the PhD students uh, serve as teaching assistants to required uh, planning courses. Ah, would, would I recommend, okay, Kat, you could answer this question. Would you recommend this program for someone interested in environmental and climate change planning? Yes, I would, because I think when you're coming from an environmental studies background, there are a lot of planning aspects to it. And I think what's cool about this program is that you can go either learning more in the coding, analytical visualization route, or you can do more community development. And also the best part about um, doing your planning at Columbia is that you have New York City to work with. You know, there's, if you don't find perhaps what you're looking for at Columbia, or you wanna go beyond the books, if you will, um, you can connect with an NGO and volunteer or you can intern. So I think that's, so yes, to answer your question. Yeah, for sure. Thank you, Kat. So someone is asking, do you encourage students to include writing sample and undergraduate work in place of pro professional portfolio? Um, it depends. So it's a qualified yes. Uh, really, um, the writing sample should be strong, really should enhance your other materials for the application, right? If it does not, don't include it, right? And sometimes it actually may actually do the opposite if the writing sample is rather weak. Um, and, uh, and also I would say, um, the writing sample, we prefer it not to be very long. Uh, you know, something like 10 pages is okay. Even a five page, you know, like an executive summary for the thesis you've written, that's good. Um, or kind of client report you've written through an internship. Um, we really want to see how you express yourself, you know, your ideas, how you organize your writing. Uh, how much you understand about planning, right? So um, it's really optional. So Isaiah, you're asking for the name of the fellowship that some of our students are in? Oh yeah, so I, it's already answered the question, great. Um, how many students are admitted? Good question. Uh, generally, our yield rate is about a third. That means you know, if you have 50 students, you admit roughly 150. Um, we very much understand that you all making different choices, visiting different schools, uh, different programs. We want to um, make sure your interest matches with what we have to offer. So maybe this is an opportunity for me to ask a few of you current students why you choose uh, Columbia. Uh, urban planning. So maybe I can ask Mauricio first, um, since we haven't turned to you for a little while now. Yeah, uh, I would say like, uh, so as I said before, like one of the reasons is uh, the opportunity to craft your curriculum as uh, as, as you want. Like, so uh, as Columbia has a lot of schools, uh, CIPA, International Affairs School, Business School, Law School, Engineering School, so you can take courses all over Colombia, you have the, you have the opportunities of all over Colombia. And uh, for example, right now I'm in the International Fellows Program of uh, CIPA, 
And I mean, Colombia gives you like a lot of opportunities um, to, and, and also like to apply to urban planning skills in the other uh, uh, courses and, and beyond planning. So I think that's one reason. Another reason is that I found is that uh, uh, the master program is not only focused on, uh, on, the, on, on the practical side, but also on the research side. Uh, which I, I find uh, that it's very important if you want to uh, tackle the challenges in an in a academic way, in a more um, um, a quantitative and qualitative way to understand the, the problems of planning. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I am very proud of our students. I want to just be very honest that because our size of the class 50, right? So you have a group of students who are like superbly uh, well tuned to theoretical uh, inquiries, debates, um, and you know our history and theory class and social, you know, our spatial exclusion classes are like very theoretical and very kind of debate-like seminars, right? Um, we have students who are really in tune to that. Then we have a group of students who are very, very capable with big data, you know, machine learning, you know, algorithm, whatever, right? Then we have another group of students who are very good with design, who are, you know, excellent with visualization. Then we have another group with a lot of climate uh, expertise and passion. And they overlap in multiple ways, right? So there's never kind of a they're separate in different silos. And so I think it's a very kind of exciting space for, I should have the students say that, but that's what I, you know, as an instructor observe um, uh, of our students. Okay, so um, to the student panel, anybody wants to address this? If you didn't come from an urban planning profession, how did you approach writing a narrative in your personal statement to tie in your relevant skills and demonstrate your qualifications for MSUP? Um, I can pick that one up. Uh, I studied anthropology and sociology in undergrad. Um, and then I took a few years um, renovating properties around St. Louis. Uh, so, I mean, neither of those are directly related to urban planning, but um, when I decided that urban planning was what I wanted to do and I wanted to go to grad school for it, um, and when I was putting together the, the application, I really just, you know, I thought a lot about what it was that I loved about those two kinds of like, you know, fields of my life and how they could be applied to urban planning, right? mostly like with the intention of kind of demonstrating the uh, the perspective that I can offer the um, the program and the perspective I can kind of bring to the classroom. So I think not having a background in urban planning is, is just fine. Uh, you just have to play it as a strength. Yes, thanks, uh, Derek. So what types of writing does the admission look for in a writing sample? For example, is a research paper better than an autobiographical one? Yes, absolutely. Um, we really are uh, very interested in your ideas uh, about planning or uh, the way that you write. But sometimes, as Derek said, you don't have a planning background. That's fine. You know, you have a sociology paper that's about family relations in a certain place. That's fine. We understand how you write, we understand how you organize ideas, how you express your ideas, right? That's really what the writing sample is about. So I think Sarah, I'm sorry, Emily's already answered uh, Sarah's question. Uh, I did mention the next question about how specifically the admission committee is looking uh, at the various components for your application. Um, I, as I mentioned earlier, very comprehensive. We have primarily four um, criteria in reviewing applications. One is academic preparation, right? Do you have the 
necessary analytical skills, which you know the personal statement asks you also to identify. And do you have uh, you know the basic uh, writing skills that we look for? You know, your personal statement will show that. So the basic academic preparation, and then uh, uh, specifically your experience. It's the second criteria whether you know you have somewhat relevant experience, either internship or work or some kind of volunteer work even. Uh, and that uh, you have been engaging with the society, you know, beyond just your college uh, school. Um, and then next is um, um, what we call it. And so it's more specifically even uh, looking at the kind of analytical skills you have. Last is um, uh, sort of the fit with um, uh, our program, uh, what we have to offer. We occasionally have students who really want to go into transportation modeling. Well, we're not the program to come to study that. I mean, we are very honest about that. Uh, we offer courses on transportation, but more uh, foundational and also in terms of looking accessibility, less about mobility. And so we approach transportation more from a, a sustainability point of view. So we don't have in-depth transportation modeling kinds of courses. And so that might not be a good fit. Um, Can I add to that um, oh, sure. from the student perspective? So I just wanna say if you're out there and maybe perhaps you're worried about your GPA or how you perform academically, I was there, you know, I'm not strong in that sense, but that's fine. I think as long as you just give a narrative of who you are, for instance, um, show more your people skills and give an example of that. Like, when did you have to be, give a consensus building? Cause you do that as a planner. When did you have to be diplomatic? Like describe that. Um, when did you initiate a project at work? Um, if you're again environmental studies, you know, I was interested in soil and trees. Like, how do I try to connect to the people aspect? Um, and what are the implications with climate change? What does that mean as a planner? So, and also just talk about how, why Columbia? You know, like, how is Columbia really going to help you to get where you want to go in your career? So, I just want to say, like, you don't just try to give more about who you are as well. You know, it's it's not just academic. I mean, obviously academic is important, but like, you know, there's other aspects to it. Great, thanks Kat. So I think we have answered all the questions in the chat box, right? If you have any, just type in. I would like to ask all of the current students, whoever wants to chime in uh, about a question that may help all of you to think about why you wanna to come to Columbia, or why you wanna study planning, that is, um, what's life like, especially now we finally our students are back on campus uh, in Columbia and New York, uh, you know, both in terms of academic life and just sort of campus life uh, as a, uh, you know, nobody sort of asked that question. I'm sure it's on your mind, probably a question that you'll be interested in more when you like see after you are admitted, but I think it's kind of uh, interesting to hear from our current students. So whoever wants to take that up. I, I get to me in this one. So, uh, so the last year I also I did the, uh, the the courses online, and now I'm doing in campus, and it's really a, a change because, like now, uh, in terms of academics, is very different to make a discussion over any topic like in person, where you can feel the the topic, you can feel the debate all over um, the classroom, uh, and also. Exp Playing your points easy, easier than uh, in Zoom and less into the academic. Like we also have some gatherings uh, every other week, and also we can, we discuss uh, a lot of uh, challenges in, in urban planning. But also we have uh, like uh, social events to have more relaxing time. Yeah. Yeah, I can also say a couple of words. I feel like there's no better place to study urban planning than in New York City. Um, everything you learn from the class, the moment you walk out of the, um, the school, you walk off campus and there you see the problems, how they are, um, like you really see the, the issues and uh, what we have accomplished so far um, in terms of subways, in terms of environmental, just, environmental health justice, um, environmental justice, 
um, air quality. So everything else is like connected. It's very different. Um, it's going to be very different if um, you're studying like a, in a school that's in a suburb and you will still be studying, you know, New York based cases, but it's just, um, you're, you won't be in New York City and see how and it feel like how those experiences are really, or policies, like how they are really um, it, so like uh, impacting people's life. So I, um, yeah, I, I'm writing a thesis on air quality and on open streets. Um, so like I would bike um, just next to campus every day and um, it's very exciting, like get to live and study the place and feel connected. Okay, I mean, an hour and a half went by pretty quickly. Um, so I want to thank you all um, for tuning in and, and also thank all of our current students, five of you and Emily to be here. And um, uh, we look forward to uh, receiving your applications and um, wish you the very best luck wherever you are in um, getting ready to apply for graduate school. It's a big step and you are already making the first you know, stride in that big step. Um, so, Yep, feel free to reach out. And uh, Emily and I will stay on a little bit in case you want to ask uh, another question or two like more individually. Uh, and then for the rest of you, uh, enjoy the rest of the day or night and um, hope to uh, connect in one way or another. Thank you, Wei Ping. Thank you all. Bye. Thank you all the students for joining. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Bye. Thank you both. That was that was really informative. I feel like I was I got so much more information out of that than I was expecting somehow. Just a, a lot about the culture of your program and, and how you're thinking about <clears throat> excuse me, evaluating incoming students. One thing I was wondering about is I've been looking at various professors' pages and like evaluating the work that they're doing and seeing what interests me and sort of imagining how I would relate to that entering this program. Um, I know some programs have sort of encouraged people to reach out to professors mm -hmm. whose work interests them. I'm generally very nervous to do that. Yeah. Um, and I'm wondering how, like, it, as I'm really trying to get a feel for the culture of the place and specifically, you know, there's not too many people here, so maybe I'll be more specific, but I'm really I really am looking for a program with a strong design ethos and design education component and seeing mm -hmm. how that fits into the way that just sort of the core curriculum works. Um, and are there people you would encourage us to reach out to, to talk about how that those skills are developed in new students? Um, should we just reach out to professors? Good question. Um, yeah, this year it's been difficult because you can't sit in a class and just, you know, talk to, well, I used to, you know, host students in my class and they really get to connect. It's difficult to connect just by email, right? Because uh, you don't really get a sense of how, uh, say, on um, design um, classes or even studio classes not being able to sit in. Uh, it's difficult. So I would, so why don't you email Emily, right? So, and, and he, if she connects you with the professor, uh, the likelihood of a you know, real connection is much, much higher. We really try not to do a lot, partially because um, at this stage, uh, partially because there's just a lot of uh, um, inquiries, uh, but you, if you have uh, interest way beyond what we have described in the booklet on the website, then that will be you know, appropriate to connect. Um, you know, certainly I think maybe Douglas Woodward, you know, some, some of the fa faculty who are more on the design side, uh, one or two people we can try to help, yeah. Yeah, great, thank you so much. I, I definitely will continue to look through those resources and then follow up as necessary, but um, I just really appreciate you taking time this evening and I hope you have a good night. Thank you. Thanks, y'all. I actually had a very similar question to the one that was previously asked, um, but uh -huh. just before dropping off, um, 
I'm, I'm particularly interested in um, understanding more about development. And so I, I know there's that real estate um, masters, but I'm, I'm in this phase right now where I'm thinking about whether to pursue that or, or just kind of stick with um, the masters in, in urban planning. And I was just wondering if um, I could get connected with a student that had a background in both. Um, it sounds like, Emily, you're the person to reach out to, um, to to explore that and see if there's a current or alumni student to see um, what kind of experience they had. And also, you know, maybe I stick to um, the potentially the, the master's in urban planning, but there's a possibility mm -hmm. to take classes um, in other um, GSAP programs, and maybe that's um, a possibility to explore, but that was just some of the, the questions I had, so. Yeah, so um, we actually have quite a bit planning students taking real estate courses. Okay. Uh, you don't need a dual degree, really. I mean, I think the mm -hmm. dual degree, what it does is give you especially in terms of the on the finance side, more exposure, right? right? But mm -hmm. if you're interested in development and the process, um, we have, I would say maybe a quarter hour students take some real estate courses, um, mm -hmm. at least one, maybe two or three or four, uh, because you, know, you can count them towards your electives, right? Any GSAP mm -hmm. course counts towards our electives. Okay. The, we also even have a real estate and the finance course for planners, right? So uh, we make sure that is accessible to planning students. So you don't even have to take real estate uh, classes to have mm -hmm. a little bit of real estate exposure. So, that's, yeah. No, that's really helpful to, um, to understand and just kind of get a perspective from you directly. So I appreciate that. Absolutely. We do also have some students who start the dual degree after their first year, and then they start in the summer after the first uh -huh. year of planning. So if you don't feel like you're getting enough access to courses or something, you sure. can always apply in the next year. And I would also add to what Wei Ping said, some of the real estate courses actually do count towards our economic and community development concentration. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and as we said, you have a lot of opportunities to take electives. You have basically 33 required electives. And then with the tuition you pay, you have another um, 12 points in electives that you can take. So you really have a lot of room to take a lot of real estate courses if you really wanted to. Got it, yeah. yeah and I, I did attend the, um, the real estate programs open house yesterday and they mentioned you know some students will start after they've started a, their their other program first so it makes yeah. a lot of sense there's just such a world of options and so many things to learn so it's it's helpful to get y'all's take on that i appreciate it thanks for your yeah. time so the two the way that the tuition works is um um you can take up to 19 credits a semester we only okay. require 60. So, you okay. know, 19 times four is 76, right? So you can take another 16 credits worth of electives if you can mm -hmm. handle 19 a semester. Sure, sure. Yeah. And students really do that. Last year with a pandemic, uh, we allowed students up to 25 credits. We actually had a few students oh, wow. do that. Wow. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, thanks again for the time. Um, I look forward to completing my application. Great. Take care. Good luck. Thank you. Okay, I think we might be able to end here now, yeah? Sorry, do you want to um do you want me to remain on? Do you want to talk no, about it? No, I think we I think they might not be uh, yeah, we can just end, right? Okay. Uh, it was great. Lots of good yeah. questions. Yeah. Okay, see you uh, in a couple of days. Yeah, bye.